Proverbs, Proverbs 31. We're looking at the latter part of the last chapter tonight. But uh, in the early part of the chapter, there's just a few verses that I think are really good verses as well in the teaching of um, the mother of Lemuel to her son. So I've used that as a basis for this prayer, which I invite you to join in the bold. The mother of Lemuel taught her son, give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. We pray, pray for those who are, who are in their lives. lives. May they be comforted and supported. We pray we for pray those, those who have, have no resources, resources to, draw to draw from. May those May around them enrich their, their, lives. their lives. The mother of Lemuel taught her son, speak out for those who cannot speak for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out. Judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. We pray, we pray for those who have had their, their voice taken, taken from them. May there be those who speak out for them. Out for them. We, pray we pray for, for those who need a large, so large. May the be others, others to supply their needs. needs. Amen. Amen. I think they're good words, but you'll notice that I didn't take up the invitation you know, as part of those words to say, uh, you know, share your alcohol around um, in generous proportions with people that are in need. Um, I took it in another direction. Just thought I'd better point that out to you. <laughs> well, I think it's meant to be given to people who are on their death door, John, yes, just that's not right. handed out <laughs> willy nilly. <laughs> it was the closest thing they had to something medicinal. Yes. So here we are in Proverbs, and uh, we've noted before, and we're just reminding you again, that the purpose of the book of Proverbs is about wisdom and instruction, understanding words of insight, learning about justice and equity, and um, cultivating a listening ear, among other things. It's about living faithfully in everyday life. And this passage, like the rest of Proverbs, is no different to this. It's meant to inspire certain ideals and guide people in how they can live in the best way possible. So the claimed source for the words of this chapter is really very unique in the Old Testament. And it's something that all us women should be celebrating. I've often been asked, do I think any women wrote the Bible? And generally I say, no, I say the book of Ruth is probably the closest I'd come, but we have this oracle in Proverbs 31, that is ascribed to the queen mother, um, the mother of Lemuel. And it says that, that while they're his words, they're an oracle his mother taught him. So here we have the source itself saying that this unnamed queen mother has composed this poem describing a woman of worth and has taught it to her son Lemuel, who writes it down here. So if that's accurate, then the description that follows may be how the queen saw herself or the queen mother and then decided she would project this vision of herself onto a desirable match for her son. It does confirm the book of Proverbs audiences, primarily young men preparing for adult responsibilities, which includes finding a wife. So we... It is claimed that this book is from non-Israelite sources, and I actually don't know how the commentary I read arrived at that because it didn't tell me, but I pass it on to you for what it is worth. It's an interesting poem. It's one of the many acrostic poems that we find in the Old Testament. Um, have you got the next slide, John? Yep. And you can see there that the coloured boxes are the Hebrew alphabet, and each line of the poem starts with the, the letter in succession of the Hebrew alphabet. So we've got an Aleph and then a Bait, then a Gimel, then a Dalet, then a Hay, and then a Avav and so on and so forth. So like most of the wisdom literature, the purpose of the poem is to draw attention to the often overlooked importance of one's faith journey of doing everyday things. And if people 
wanted you to remember it a little bit more than something else. It was these acrostic forms were used because it's not exactly a rhyme, but it's a way of helping people remember it um, a little bit better when you know that each line is going to start with the next letter of the alphabet. Now, the woman of Proverbs has two issues that centre around translation and they shape how we interpret this text. And I'll just move you slightly to out the way there. The first one is the woman for uh, wife, uh, the word, sorry, for woman or wife and, um, and the word for husband. So the word for husband is up there. Normally the word for husband is ish. That's the one on the left. And the one on the right is what is actually used in the text. It's Baal, which is a word for um, Lord or Master. So it's a more hierarchical term that's being used in here. It is translated all the way through as husband though. So I thought I'd just point this out to you. She's, it's actually talking about the Lord or Master. And if it is about King Lemuel, well, that makes sense. But um, the second issue is the character of the woman, which is at the heart of the poem, and that is a more important one. We're going to start exploring this by looking at uh, Bible Project's whole video on Proverbs. And I'm doing that because, and you'll understand why by the end of tonight, why I'm using the whole thing, because you can't understand the woman of valour at the end in Proverbs 31, unless you understand the way Proverbs has a, as a book actually works. So we'll watch that now. The Book of Proverbs. The word proverb typically refers to a short, clever saying that offers some kind of wisdom. And this book has a lot of those. But they're almost all in the center section of the book, chapters 10 to 29. But there is way more going on in the Book of Proverbs, especially at the beginning, chapters 1 through 9, and the conclusion, chapters 30 and 31. The book's been designed with an introduction, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and it first of all links this book to King Solomon. Now remember the story in 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon had asked God for wisdom to lead Israel well, and so Solomon became known as the wisest man in the ancient world, and we're told in 1 Kings chapter 4 that he wrote thousands of proverbs and poems and collected knowledge about plants and animals. So Solomon was like the fountainhead of Israel's wisdom literature. So while not all the material in this book is written by him personally, he is where Israel's wisdom tradition began. The introduction says that by reading this book, you too can gain wisdom. Now, wisdom for most of us means knowledge, but the Hebrew word chokhmah means much more than just mental activity. It refers to action also. So think skill or applied knowledge. This is why back in the book of Exodus, chapter 31, it was artists and craftsmen in Israel who were said to have chokhmah. So the purpose of this book is to help you develop a set of practical skills for living well in God's world. And this gets linked with another key idea in the introduction, the fear of the Lord. Now fear here is not about terror. It's about a healthy sense of reverence and awe for God and about my place in the universe. It's a moral mindset that recognizes I am not God and that I don't get to make up my own definitions of good and evil and right and wrong. Rather, I need to humble myself before God and embrace God's definition of right and wrong, even when that's inconvenient for me. Now, this introduction leads us into the first main section of the book, chapters 1 through 9, which also doesn't contain short one-liner proverbs. Rather, what we find here are 10 speeches from a father to a son about how the son should listen to wisdom and cultivate the fear of the Lord and live accordingly, which means a life of virtue and integrity and generosity, all of which lead to success and peace. And the father warns his son also about folly and evil and stupid decisions that will breed selfishness and pride, all leading to ruin and shame. And so the son should make the pursuit of wisdom and the fear of the Lord his highest goal in life. And this way of thinking, it forms the moral logic of this entire book. Now, these speeches from the Father also clue us into what biblical wisdom literature is and how it's different from other parts of the Bible. 
These books explore how to live well in God's world, but wisdom is not the same as law, like what Moses gave Israel at Mount Sinai. And it's not the same as prophecy, divine speech to God's people. Rather, wisdom literature has the accumulated insight of God's people through the generations about how to live in a way that honors God and others. And so, through the book of Proverbs now, these human words about wisdom have been put together as God's word and wisdom to his people, which connects to the other thing you find in chapters 1 through 9. There are four poems from Lady Wisdom. Here, wisdom has been poetically personified as a woman who calls out to humanity to pay attention and to seek her. Wisdom says that she is woven into the fabric of the universe, and so wherever you see people make wise decisions, they are relying on her. So you see someone being generous or having sexual integrity or upholding justice. They are drawing on wisdom. These Lady Wisdom poems, they're a creative, poetic way of exploring this idea that we live in God's moral universe and that goodness and justice are objective realities that we ignore to our own peril. And so fearing the Lord, living wisely, it's living along the grain of the universe. Now together, these two sets of speeches from the Father and Lady Wisdom, they make a powerful claim about this book, that you're not simply reading good advice, you're reading God's own invitation to learn wisdom from previous generations. And so in the next section of the book, chapters 10 through 29, we find hundreds of ancient proverbs, and they apply wisdom and the fear of the Lord to every life topic you could imagine. Family, work, neighborhood, friendship, sex, marriage, money, anger, forgiveness, alcohol, debt, everything. And these are all filtered through the value system of Proverbs 1 through 9. Now these Proverbs, they're all pretty short. They're easy to memorize. And actually this section of the book is meant to become a reference work that you return to time and time again throughout the years, which raises some important issues in learning how to read these Proverbs. First of all, Proverbs are by nature about probabilities. So you fear the Lord and you make wise, good choices things will likely go well for you. And if you don't fear the Lord, you're foolish, your life will likely not go so well. Now, that is all often true, but not always. Which leads to the next point, that Proverbs are not promises. They're not formulas for success. So, some Proverbs, for example. The fear of the Lord prolongs your life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Or, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't turn from it. So yes, fearing God, being a moral person, will most likely lead to a better, longer life. And raising your kids in a stable, loving home does set them up well. But there are no guarantees. Lots of things can and often do go wrong in our world. And so lastly, Proverbs by nature focus on the general rule, but not the exceptions, which are many. And the wisdom books actually aren't ignorant of that. The exceptions are what the other wisdom books, Job and Ecclesiastes, are all about. And together, these acknowledge that life is too complex for simple formulas, which is why we need all of the wisdom books together to get the bigger picture. This all leads to the final section of the book, two large collections of poems. First, poems from a man named Agur, who begins by acknowledging his own ignorance and folly and his great need for God's wisdom. And then Agur discovers that divine wisdom has been given to him in the scriptures, which teach him how to live well. And so Agur is put before us as like a model reader of the book of Proverbs, somebody who's always open to hearing God's wisdom through the scriptures. The final poems are connected to a man named Lemuel. He's a non-Israelite king. And he passes on the wisdom that was given to him by his mom. It's guidance for being a wise and just leader. And then the final poem is an acrostic or an alphabet poem where each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the entire poem's about the woman of noble character. It depicts a woman who lives according to the wisdom of Proverbs and stands like a model of someone who takes God's wisdom and then translates it into practical decisions in everyday life, at work or at home, in her family and in her community. So the book opened with words from a father to a son about listening to Lady Wisdom. And so now the book closes by offering the words of a mother to her son about a woman who lives wisely. 
The book of Proverbs is for every person in every season of life. It's a guide for living wisely and well in God's good world. And that's what the book of Proverbs is all about. Okay, I have a question for all of you now. Grab a Bible or grab your phone with your Bible on your phone or your um, wherever you keep it on your iPad or whatever. And I want you to have a look at Proverbs 31 and look up the first uh, verse of the poem about the woman, which is verse 10, and tell me what it says. You'll need to unmute yourselves because I unmuted you all for the um, video. So is she a wife or a woman, for example? And what adjective describes her? Oh, capable. She's capable. Yep. Precious. Well, precious. She's precious. Who's got that in there? What translation's that? NRSV. Oh, that must be the second bit. Just the first bit. So a capable oh. woman or wife who can find just that bit there. We know Virtuous. she's more precious than jewels. Sorry. Virtuous. She's virtuous. Is she a wife or a woman? A wife. Is a woman of strength and mighty valor. And can help find pleasure. Sorry. A woman of strength. What's what translation's that, Jen? Uh, yeah, um, 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 the, 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 what's it called? I forgot what it's called now. Um, the passion translation. The which translation? Passion. I don't know that one. Passion translation. <laughs> Okay, what else have people got? I've got two different ones here. Okay, what are they, James? I've got Capable Wife, and that's the New English Bible. Yep. Because I know everyone's got the NRSV, so I went different. Um, and I've got Strong and Loving Wife, and that's the Inclusive Bible, which I found very interesting. I strong and they... Loving? Well, they've just made that bit up. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Good on them. I've got the Bible for today, contemporary English version. Uh, what did it say? Sorry, Anne. Um, Joan, a truly good wife is the most precious treasure a man can find. Oh, it's not Anne, it's Joan. Sorry. Um, I couldn't see you. I was going on voices. So, um, a most I'm precious looking at a camel Bible, and that says a virtuous woman. Hey. A virtuous woman. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't say about a wife. All right. So is it wife or woman? Is it noble, competent, capable, excellent, virtuous or good? Or is it strong, as Jen said? Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we're going to explore because a lot of things hang on this. And before we explore them, I've just got a little video to show you about how this woman has frequently been seen. <laughs> <laughs> we know Superman, Batman, and Spider-Man, but this superhero has not been portrayed on the big screen, and if she does appear in a movie, we're quite certain Sandra Bullock will play her. It's the Proverbs 31 woman! She wields some of the most influential powers. Of the universe. <laughs> I saw that, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I live with this. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here we have this poem at the end of Proverbs, and it's probably been one of the misunderstood passages in the Bible. And it's seen as a list of virtues, mostly by males, that are to form a job description for their ideal and faithful wife. It appears on Mother's Days, on weddings. It appears in complementarian Christian circles, not mentioning the Sydney Anglicans, where it stands <laughs> as the pinnacle which women should strive to emulate. But is this really what Proverbs 31's purpose is? And we've seen from what we've just watched with Bible um, Project, it's to celebrate wisdom in action, not to instruct women everywhere about how to get married, have children and take up weaving. <laughs> we find all is not what it seems so we're going to start with the next contentious piece of translation which is the most important one it's Shet Shail 
and women of valor or women of strength. So hey, yeah, all hail to Jen Flanagan's Bible. It was the closest of everyone's to what it actually means. Uh, woman of valor is, is probably the preferred translation I would use for this. And so it's not a job description for a domestic goddess, but is written in praise of women. And this opening verse should be translated in this way. The Hebrew, Eshet Shael, um, has a male equivalent, which is Gibba Shael, man of valour. It is a reminder that to men um, that as well as men of valour, there are also women of valour. And the Hebrew, in both terms, emphasises the equality as it is applied to both genders. In fact, it's an actual identical term, except one is Gibbal, which is man, and one is um, Eshet, which is woman. So uh, in Hebrew, of course, woman and wife can be uh, translated from this same word. So context would often tell you which one you would use. By the end of it, I'm going to say this is, she is married, we know that but I'm going to say it should be translated as woman for reasons that you will pick up along the way. So its primary meaning is quite militaristic. It means physical strength and might and power. And that's just a little bit of a concordance up there in the NASB, how what the words are used to translate this particular word, shayil. And you can see there's quite a lot. Its plural form always designates warriors or an army. So that's obviously what its origins were. Translations that erase the woman's physical strength and power like she's virtuous, create a construction of stereotypical femininity that should be put in the bin and are not present in the text. So when Shail occurs in verse three, referring to the man, at the beginning of Proverbs 31, it's translated as strength. And it says, do not give your strength to women. This is part of the directions. Yet when we find it in 31.10, we find it is virtuous and noble and good and other things that actually donate, do not donate that quality. So I'm going to, and you can see there that there's a few um, people where Shael is applied to. Moses chose able men, um, Shael and Jephthah, the Gileadite, one of the silliest men in the Bible, was a mighty <laughs> warrior. He was, just read his story. Um, and he is Shael. And interestingly enough, <coughs> he's been on her husband's side. Yes, it is Boaz. And he is a Gibber Shael. And this will be important for reasons that will become obvious shortly. So we're going to move to a question now for your groups to think about. And this is to do with translations. What impressions of the woman do most translations create? In what ways are they softening the original intent of strength and power? And why are they using strength when Shail is applied to a male, but capable or virtuous or good? when it's applied to a female. So I want you to put your minds to this in your breakout rooms. And <coughs> so I'm gonna pop you all into breakout rooms now. Uh, Stop, I'll forget to press the button, go on. Obviously, um, there's also one Hebrew word which covers a, multi, a wide spectrum of meaning of which strength is one of them. And obviously <coughs> capability is another. But as you read on in the chapter, it is largely about capability. She's a, yeah. she's a capable well, person. Absolutely. Is it Roger? Pardon? I, I is think... it Roger? Or am I going to surprise you with other translations? Oh, you can. <laughs> you won't surprise me at all, Elizabeth. I'm, we're, we're beyond surprise now. <laughs> Beyond surprise, I don't know how to take that. Oh, I don't know whether I'd... <laughs> predictable, is he saying you're predictable? Uh, I don't think you're, so. You're a, you're a strong woman and you're a capable woman and I won't, I won't sort of say which, which I'm talking about in this context. <laughs> okay, uh, John and Anne, have you got your hand up? Yeah, I did. Uh, it just seems to me you have to be strong 
to do all the all the things she does get up before everybody else do the best weaving you can do get all the food keep uh, everybody you if you're a weak woman you cannot possibly manage to do all of that it is a superwoman indeed that is being described it is but she's not precious and mm -hmm. she's not she got time. She hasn't got time to be precious. Um, and she's certainly not a lot of other mm -hmm. those translators that we initially heard. So we'll move on and see what um, else she's can up I, to. Can I say? Patricia, yes. Don't forget to take your hand down, John and Anne. Yeah, uh, Patricia. Yeah, um, my version of the Bible said noble. And it seems to bear out the fact that it was used about a woman in the upper echelon of society who had servants. So when we look at this massive achievement she achieved, she had a lot of support to do that. Yeah, she, she was, did. And so um, I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that, well, it's certainly changing the meaning of Proverbs 31 for me yeah. in the sense that she's an upper, uh, an, of noble birth. She is of noble birth, but that is still not the correct translation. Someone can be of noble birth and still described in other ways, such as strong or capable or whatever. That's an inference from the reading the rest of it, and it's been translated from that inference. That is poor practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to move on now. And there's more surprises. So we're going to look at what Professor Will um, Gainey says, and she's in your note. She has an online com commentary. She that's translates right. verse 3. That's when we've got King uh, Lemuel talking. Do not give your warriors strength to women. So she doesn't just translate it as strength. She says it's warriors strength to women in 31.3, and then she translates 31.10 as who can find a woman of warrior strength. Now, the reason she's doing that is when it is attached to a male, as I said, this word, um, shale, it's usually to do with a warrior. So to water it down to just capable or precious or some of those other things, or noble or honest or even good, is to actually water down this word quite a bit. So um, Gaffney believes that the Queen Mother is seeking a woman for her son who will match him strength for strength and be his equal. And I was thinking she must have found him quite a handful if she's wishing this woman <laughs> on him. And you'll know a lot more about her, I assure you, in the, in the next half hour. Other language in the text also points not only to the woman being strong, but it uses very military terms. And you find them in other places and they're quite clear. In verse 11, your translations will say something like, the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. Now that word they're translating gain is the Hebrew word for spoils. It's the term for wartime plundering. So here we have this woman again having a military term ascribed to her. She provides spoils to her lord or master, or lord and master, if you like, but to her lord. So the heart of her lord trusts in her, and he will have no lack of spoils. Very military statement there. Odyssea. Yes, she is a bit Odyssea. of a Odyssea. Yeah. She certainly is. So um, in verse 17, she girds her arms with strength and makes her arms um, strong. So you have this repetition of strength. Um, in the poem and Shail itself already says she's a strong woman so it's telling you she's a strong woman and in verse 25 it reinforces it again strength and dignity and the word for dignity can also be translated as majesty uh, so strength and majesty or strength and dignity are her clothing and back in verse 15 we've got another very curious one there it says she rises while it's night and provides food for her household. Again, that's not is what the Hebrew said. It says she provides prey for her household. Um, and the implication here is that she's actually slaughtering the beast for the household for food, the meat, which is generally a man's task. So she's not your ordinary female and she's got all these male and military 
terms ascribed to her, which our translators have persistently and consistently softened down and altered. So, if you thought you could trust your translations, think again. <laughs> and a good not, argument for, for learning Hebrew, isn't it? No, don't. There's never any <laughs> argument for learning Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> I learned it for two and a half years and it was such a struggle anyway. Mm. So Brent Strawn in his commentary talks about the statements and the sentiments of verse 17 and 25 go far beyond the home and market. They're used of mighty warriors. And he gives you a number of references which are in your notes. Psalm 77 and 83, Ezekiel 30 and Nahum um, chapter 2. So it should come as no surprise then that the word capable, shayil, in verse 10 is the same word translated strength in 31 and excellently in 3129. So for the female, they're, they're, they're actually really um, hedging their bets about what she is meant to be described as. And as I said, they persistently and consistently soften this down. So... Let's now look at the Gibber Shail, the man of valour, and see how this word stacks up when it's used about blokes. And I'll get so, this up to do it. So unfortunately, there's no video to show for this, <laughs> like we had with the woman. Um, but the, 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 the phrase Gibber Shail certainly uh, suggests military strength. It's used many times. These are just a few of the times that it's used in the Hebrew Bible. The young David is described as Gibor Shail the Ishmechama, a man of valor and a man of war. It certainly and was. His warfaring capacity is proven soon after in his fight that he wins with Goliath. And of course, it's a central feature of how David became king and maintained his kingship. He had to uh, dispose of a number of um, pretenders to the throne, mainly his brothers and generals and stuff like that. Um, and then he waged war to maintain his, his um, hold on the throne. Uh, Gideon, oh, sorry, David's men are described by the same phrase. They are these warrior men, these Gibor Shailim, these, these um, warriors. Gideon is described by the same phrase in the book of Judges. The army of Joshua, as it marshals together, preparing to take Jericho, it is used with this, it described using the same phrase. And interestingly, in the book of Ruth, when Boaz is introduced, he's identified with this same phrase, a gibor shale, a man of valor, we might say. And then in Chronicles, there's a whole bunch of armed warrior. Israelite men, the sons of Reuben, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that are identified using the same phrase. So we have a translator bias going on here because strength is how Shael is used when it is for men, strength in the military warrior sense, capable, virtuous, good for the woman when it's applied to her. So we're going to put you back in your groups to consider this translated bias and why it might be there. So why do men become, uh, why are they strong and warrior-like and women are capable, virtuous and good? So we're going to give you another few minutes to think about this. How did you get on with our question this time? So why are these translators showing this particular bias, do you think? Well, I put in something which is a bit out of left field, and that's about a psychological mother complex. Uh, meaning <laughs> that uh, a lot, and, and I've met it, a lot of men are very fearful of powerful women so that they would kind of come in and take them over and uh, entrap them and bewitch them. And so it, the woman has to be in her place and that, that place has to be nurturing and loving and caring and supportive. And you can't be warrior and can't be angry. It can't be something that bites. Okay. Yeah. And well, it can't be threatening. It's got to be non-threatening. Yeah. Non-threatening. Yep. So yeah. they've got your caster complexes, you reckon, Dorothea? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking, 
it's an unconscious bias. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other takes on it? I, I <laughs> well, wondered about whether um, one of two things, and I'm not, and this is my lack of ignorance in the culture at the time it was written, about whether it's one battle is something that's honourable for the blokes and that you couldn't possibly apply these sort of um, descriptors to humble women um, or whether it's the other way around that battle and war and crap like that is below where a woman should be like it's dirty men's work and shouldn't be applied to women so no it's not dirty men's work i mean that's noble stuff hmm. being well, a i wasn't warrior. sure because i thought maybe the well i thought maybe the noble stuff was me westernizing it um because i'm not no, sure. unless it's I'm always saying. been honorable for everyone so i'm not sure <laughs> but uh, i but, sorry but elizabeth tells her uh, the original bible talks about a strong woman so it is the translations that we are talking about so whether yes. it happened in mm. jewish times or not that that is not the issue that jews have accepted woman to be a strong woman it's the uh, modern day translators who are watering it down i think that's right Yep. There's yep. an industry. Ah. You, if somebody, if you're going to publish something, you need money, and you, the kings publish publish Bibles, conservative evangelical power groups publish Bibles, mm. and you have an agenda, and that I'm sure that shapes how the scholars interpret the Bible. Because most like, scholars on these committees are practising Christians, and a lot of them, because they want to bring out a Bible translation, are very pra uh, practising. They're more towards the conservative side of Christianity, let's put it that way. Yeah. Yep. So I've got a friend who works in the Christian industry, and he's sort of got to believe certain things be, to sort of pay the bills, you know? Yeah. And I think that happens a bit. Hmm. In the Bible, it happens a lot. It isn't just about the issues of gender. There's mistranslations all over the place. One of my favourite ones is um, the story of Jesus doing healing. And um, the word that is actually used is then bramaomai, which literally means to snort like a horse. So <laughs> it reads, Jesus, having snorted like a horse, sent him on his way. Um, but you will never find it translated like that. It's usually right. the King James says straightly charged, whatever that means. And you'll find sternly ordered or strictly commanded. You'll find all this stuff like that. That is not even close to what the Greek says. The Greek mm. says Jesus snorted like a horse. But we can't cope with that in our modern day time because it has no cultural context for us whatsoever and seems just yeah. beautiful. So it's never translated. Now, I've got more sympathy with that than I have with this particular case here because mm. I think you're absolutely right. I think Kumar and Peter are right. This is about keeping women in their box by a certain translation. So we're going to go on and we're going to look at another woman of valour. Um, the phrase that we use in here, um, um, Eshet Shail, is used twice. So there is another woman of valour and guess who it is? That would be Ruth. Maybe. So um, Boaz says to Ruth in chapter three, something. And these are different translations we have here. So all the women, uh, all the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Now you can see there that Ruth's nobility in this translation can't possibly refer to her being an upper class woman. She's a really, really poor woman gleaning in someone else's field every day in the hot sun for barley and wheat and she's a destitute Moabite that's how she's presented who's followed her Jewish mother-in-law back to Bethlehem so um, noble can't be applying to wealth in this case for all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman what does that mean who knows um, you are respected by everyone in the town so let's water it down a bit more and everybody in town knows what a courageous woman you are, a real prize. And I say we shoot Eugene Peterson for his misogynistic, sexist tendencies. Well, I think he's already dead. Well, yeah. 
Yeah. Mary May, a real prize. That is just not in the Greek. And that reduces this woman to being a good yes. catch. To be an object, right? Yep. Yeah. That's it. Great. And, and Eugene, you should be ashamed of yourself wherever you are. So and then we have the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint or the LXX. Translate this phrase, Eshet Shail, as Gunaika and Drayan. Now, that says brave woman there because I copied it, but it's literally a manly woman. How do I know that? And why isn't it brave? It's because Andre is the Greek word for man. That's what it means. And Gunaikos is the female, is the word for female or woman. So what it's saying there literally is she's a woman man. So manly woman is probably the best translation you can get. And that's because the Greek translators of the Hebrew Bible knew what it meant. So that's why the Greek actually reflects the Hebrew, that she is a manly woman. So um, they got it right and all the rest of them probably got it wrong. So Ruth's life looks nothing like the life of the woman depicted in Proverbs 31. So how does she end up with this particular title? So she's not trading linens with merchants. She's not running a home full of servants and buying fields. She's working all day, as I said, in the sun. So what is going on here? Now, I'm going to suggest that um, Ruth is identified here as a woman of valour, not because she's checked off the domestic goddess list in Proverbs 31, but she's lived her life with resourcefulness, compassion, courage, wisdom, and strength. In other words, she's lived a life of valour, and that is what Boaz is recognising when he calls her this phrase. In the book of Ruth, interestingly enough, as we've noted before, Boaz is identified as a gibbershale. He's a man of valour. And he certainly is a man of great status in the town. He's wealthy. Um, people look up to him at the town gates where they do um, working out disputes and judging and matters of law, etc. So when Boaz uses Eshet Shael of Ruth, he clearly sees her as his equal when he calls her this term. So my question now is for you to think about is how does this usage of um, Eshet Shael in the book of Ruth change how you see the woman in Proverbs 31? I want you to think about that. So how does the usage of um, Eshet Shael in Ruth, about Ruth, how does that help us understand how the woman in Proverbs 31 should be evaluated using this term? Are you all clear about the question? How did you get on in your rooms? How is looking at Ruth as an Eshet Shael or woman of valour helped you understand Proverbs? At the last minute, we raised the question, not me, of what is the meaning of valour? Could mm. you tell us, please? Well, it's probably someone who is brave, courageous, resourceful, resilient, compassionate, has wisdom and strength. Thank you very much. <laughs> I did think I read that out before you went into groups, but so, yeah. But my, my, my problem with that is it's not a word that's commonly used today. No, it's not. Although somebody this morning <clears throat> pointed out that um, there are military kind of um, awards for valour. Yes. Yes. Right. Military yes. and, and rescue type awards, you know. Yes. It's used yes. in that context, perhaps. Mm. Yeah. So it's still got a military sense about it, even in our world today. <laughs> In a military sense, uh, I think it means that you actually put the unit or the, or the rest of the people there, they're concerned in front of your own. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. So someone of valour puts the concerns of others before themselves, mm. as well as being that other list of things I read out. Yeah. And to me, it also involves being able to uh, think about a situation and analyze it um, and then make a decision before you actually go and do the physical work. Um, mm. you, you've got to be able to have your plan of action or whatever the circumstance is. 
Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, Ruth has a really quite clear plan of action when it's applied to her in Chapter 3. Mm -hmm. And everyone from Tuggeranong who's done that study with me smiles at that point because they know about the threshing floor. <laughs> You'll have, All the rest of you will have to wait till we get to it. Um, <laughs> But does it help or change how we see the woman in Proverbs? What is it saying about Eshet Shail? Is it about what you do in terms of your weaving or your servants or being a good wife? Is that what Ruth's doing? Is she a good wife and mother? No. no I don't, I don't She's a widow. Really that's I right. She's cleaning in a field, so it can't mean that, can it? I was thinking it was, it, it's about doing the best you can with what you've got. Yes, and one's got rather a lot and Ruth's got rather a little. But, um, yes, it is doing. It's about that resilience and doing the best you can with what you've got would be part of it. But it doesn't mean that you are a dutiful wife and mother who is a domestic goddess. Now, you can be that and an Ashet Shail, but that is not what Ashet Shail means. That is my point. Because it's applied to Ruth, and that is not what Ruth is, is she? Well, if we want to use the word strength, it'd be strength of character. Yes, that's a good way of putting it, John. So both of these women are showing strength of character, and that's much closer to the mark. And that's the point I wanted to make about using Ruth to look at the woman in Proverbs. She's often held up as why you need to be a Proverbs. I found things all over the internet saying how to be a Proverbs 31 woman. And that was about how to obey your husband, look after him and do all this domestic stuff. That is not what Ruth is doing. So that's not what a Shet Shail can mean. Otherwise, Ruth would be already married to Boaz, looking after his small et cetera. So that's why that is important. It is. Okay, so we're going to look at social scientific criticism briefly. We did this in the Old Testament course with Leviticus, and this is just looking what the passage tells us about society back at that time. So we know she is a wealthy woman. We know her and her family have luxury garments because it says they've got red and purple. They're the most expensive colours. Her husband isn't an agricultural labourer. He's involved in civic matters. Um, she has access to imported food. She's got a surplus of resources because she can be charitable. That is, she can give away things to the poor. So she's a well-to-do urban woman. She is not representative of roughly 90% of women who lived in peasant households in ancient Israel. Unlike most of the matriarchs of the Bible, this woman's life does not revolve around her children and especially her sons. Um, she is, we know she's got children because in verse 28, it does say that they rise up and call her happy. But we don't hear about her praying for children. We don't hear about their conception or birth or that they're particularly blessed by God or that there is a mother-child relationship which is the key Torah recommendation for womanhood in the ancient world. This is missing from this. Children are there, but they're just one point along the way. She's not defined by her children or her sons or her husband as many other women in the Hebrew Bible are. So she's very unusual. This is a woman who does things. She's got verbs everywhere. So Proverbs 31 is about her doing lots of things. So we've got seeking, working, bringing, rising, considering, planting. Uh, she's spinning. She is opening her hand to the poor. She makes things. She supplies the merchant with sashes that, she, that she's made. So she's very active. She's got all these verbs about her. And we're not given much in the way of women's appearance. And normally, unless we're talking about judges and prophets such as Holdar or Deborah, women are usually described in the Hebrew Bible by their physical attributes and where they um, are attractive to men. So we have people like Rachel and Rebecca and Sarah are all described as quite beautiful and they have these male, um, the patriarchs fall in love with them or they're graceful, or they're, 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 you know, they've got these pleasing figures, etc. Not here, though. 
We have no clue about the woman of Bella's height or weight or shape. We have no idea if she's beautiful, is she young, is she old, is she built like a brick shit house, as they used to say. Um, we don't know and it doesn't really matter. So this passage offers a very subversive and countercultural message, much like um, we've heard with wisdom back last week and at the beginning of the book of Proverbs. So the closing verse tells you, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. The whole emphasis isn't on looks or superficial qualities, but the character and the qualities and the faithfulness of the woman. So that's a really important thing, I think. How relevant is this image of the woman of valour for us today? And what message might she bring to a world where women are bombarded with messages about ageing, their body shape and their beauty? And we might just have a few comments about this in the big group. What do you think about this? Well, I think it's rather exciting that the woman can express herself in as an individual, her own person. That's bang on the money, Patricia, and not everyone picks that up. This is an independent woman. She is really, really unusual in the ancient womanly world um, because she's going about buying fields and trading stuff and importing things, and she's doing it, not a husband. So, Anne, you had your hand up. John and Anne, did you have your hand up? Or was that a mistake? <coughs> So she's not a typical woman of that age then? No, she's a woman of valour. No, right. she's not. <laughs> and neither is Ruth, as you all learn, um, mm. and when we come to look at her. So no, she's not. She's like Lady Wisdom. She's countercultural. She's subversive. She's, in, she's got male descriptions about her. She's in a, a male domain when it comes to trade, to killing animals. To, tray, um, to actually buying a field. Normally the husband would do that, not her. Uh, she's got a lot of things about her that aren't what you would call normal biblical feminine qualities. So David, yeah. is your hand up and John's yeah. and Anne's hands up again. Yeah. Um, it also ties in that parallel uh, in the Song of Songs where the Shulamites hard working and dares to go out at night to find a lover. Yep. And the, the, the female chorus, uh, which some writers liken to the daughters of Jerusalem and Isaiah, very flippant. They're just, you know, giggling and, and concerned with appearances and things like that. So that's also had a contrast in Song of Songs. Yeah, wisdom right. literature generally is very favourable to women. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, Anne and John? Yes. Uh, look, I like your translation. I like your spin on the whole thing but I think you have to have done Elizabeth Rain and John Squire's course to get that description. I still think that it's being used by more people to hold women in place and and um, keep women down. Then I, I, I don't think it does a lot of good on the whole. Well it is being used that way but my point is um, this isn't so much my spin on it I'm telling you what the Hebrew says. Oh, uh, look, I, I agree with, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm being a bit flippant. I understand that. But what I'm really saying is we need to do this sort of course to come up with that. Yeah, you do. And if you look at it on face value, it, it really is saying, women, this is where you belong. And translators are not helping us mm. by not translating that phrase in a way that actually conveys what it really means. We are doing this woman a disservice and we're doing women everywhere a disservice. But if we took it as it is meant to be taken, it does have, I think, bring some sort of um, countercultural message to women who are told they're too old or they're not beautiful enough or they've got to use a certain face cream or they've got to use weight or they've got to wear this sort of clothing. It, it dispenses with all of that. And this is what I like about her. Yes, she's well to do but she's been judged on her independence and her capacity, her resilience, her strength. Mm. That's what's important, in the same way that Ruth is ascribed these things. So what will the fashion industry say about this? 
Not much, I would think. I don't know. They'd be very impressed by it. <laughs> yeah. They paid for the translation. Oh, they yeah. may well have done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good comeback there, John. <laughs> so who is this woman of valour, really? Well, I showed you the whole picture of Proverbs in the little video because I was hoping that you might pick up how this woman of valour and lady wisdom are actually related to each other because I think they are. Okay. So, the book of Proverbs tells us a lot about wisdom, that's chokhmah, mm. and, and, and this woman of valour. And wisdom has been called to walk in her ways and follow a path. And when we see Proverbs 31 in the larger context of wisdom literature and the more immediate context of Lady Wisdom, the woman of Proverbs could be understood as not an actual flesh and blood woman, well, she is superwoman, but as the ideal of Lady Wisdom herself. And indeed, several verses seem to suggest this is quite possible. The woman of valour is far more precious than jewels. Wisdom is far more precious than jewels. The woman and wisdom both open their mouth with wisdom. Both are described as strong women. Both laugh at the time to come. So there's a few similarities there that might make us suspicious that maybe something more is going on than coincidence. According to Amy Oden um, in her commentary, this woman of valour is meant to be a tangible expression of lady wisdom. Odin then goes on to say what we need to note this passage does not say that a wife's worth is derived from her husband, nor is she a derivative being on whom um, her status depends on her husband. In fact, she's very independent. Her virtue and worth are a result of her own agency. Her actions and choices are her own. She leads her own life and she does not follow someone else's. She pursues her own end. She's not paying orders. And she's, there's no hint that the industry she has is not her own, that she's demure, that she is deferential, or that her pursuits are directed by others. So in other words, she is as independent as Lady Wisdom, and she's quite clear on what her pursuits and purposes are. And as I said, there's quite a lot of male language around this, as there are with Lady Wisdom, who's doing quite unladylike things, as is this woman. Um, and there seems to be a similarity there between the two. So how do you think this, what do you think of this opinion that the woman of valour is actually what we'd see as what wisdom would look like were she um, clothed in flesh, as it were? And how does this help us understand the passage? Do you agree or not agree with Odin? What do you think about that? I can say it because it fits the uh, Lady <laughs> Wisdom we made earlier in Proverbs. It does. And it means we've yeah. got a bracket around the book of Proverbs. We start with Lady Wisdom oh. and, we fend, and we end with the Woman of Valour. Book, book ends. Okay. Also, book ends. Right, yeah. yeah. It also mentions the city gates again. It does. Oh, point. Yes, it is. Her husband's doing praising her in the city gates. So we've got a mention of it, though wisdom herself is at the city gates in the first one. But yes, there is that um, corresponding use of those words. Thank you. It makes me wonder whether a woman wrote it. Well, according to it itself, a woman did write it. It tells you at the beginning, this is the Queen Mother's words. Oh, it's the whole of Proverbs. OK. Oh, no, not the whole of Proverbs, no, no. just <clears throat> Proverbs okay. 31. Um, oh. Lady Wisdom, it's an interesting question. I can't see some of those patriarchal blokes of the Hebrew Bible penning chapters one and um, eight and nine about and three about wisdom. Um, mm. Maybe a woman did write it. We know there were literate women. Holdar, the prophetess, is a literate woman. <clears throat> okay. So they existed. They're rare, but they existed. This woman here is probably a literate woman if she's dealing with merchants and doing stuff like that. Mm. That's just and an inference. like, it's pretty amazing that it actually stayed in the Hebrew Bible, and it's pretty amazing that it's it's in the like it's still in 
the Old Testament that we read, I reckon, because, for example, I have never, ever heard anybody in a, a preach on Proverbs, you know, on, on Lady Wisdom. I've never heard a sermon on, on her, on, on the feminine side of God, who was there with God at the very beginning of creation. I gave so, one last Sunday, Peter. Good on, on you. Oh, well, I had to discover <laughs> it myself. I was just, I discovered that myself about five years ago. And I'm thinking, what, how, how, how could I not have, you know, like how many Christians know about this stuff? A lot of them know about it, but it's twisted to make women subservient. It's like what happened yeah. to Mary, the mother of Jesus. We have the Magnificat with this subversive antisocial woman that's turning the whole, she's singing the whole social order upside down. And we turn her into this doe-eyed, blue-clad vision of prayerful obedience. That is not <laughs> what she is like in the Magnificat. That is not what she's doing. And we did right. it to Mary and we've done it to this woman here. Largely with yeah. the help of male translators. Or we turn them into prostitutes like Mary Magdalene. Yes, or we turn them into prostitutes like Mary Magdalene because she must have been a prostitute, mustn't she? Now, the Bible never says that. Anyway, she was a sinful woman, wasn't she? No, she wasn't. That's the thing. Oh, there okay. was a she sinful was woman, but it one. wasn't Mary. Yeah. Okay. Mary There's Magdalene had a um, spirit or something, didn't she? Yeah, she was possessed by demons, seven demons. Okay. Right. Yeah. It's but just she's referred assumption. to as, as as Magdalene, the Mag coming from Magdala, the tower. That's so correct. Some writers suggest that she's tall and you know. And, and has leadership qualities, you know, from, from what you see that she does. Yeah. yeah. And that's largely based on that um, document that was discovered. And I think there's questions about whether it's genuine um, about this gospel of Mary. Mm. And if it is genuine, it's a much later document. But it does show there was a tradition that followed that kind of trajectory about her and had those beliefs about her. So to conclude... The connections between the woman of valour and lady wisdom suggest we are looking here at a wise and mythological ideal rather than superwoman we are supposed to emulate. So it's not a real woman, but it's like the way lady wisdom would be if she was acting out. And in a sense, she's all women. So she does all of these things and she is something that represents all of us and all of us do some of those things and we probably do them well. But she does all of those things. So she's like the archetypal woman, if you like. And right. these words, Ashet Shail, the woman of valour or courage or discernment or flexibility or however you want to see it, is used by modern Jewish women today. And I really like this. They use it as a way of cheering each other along. They use it in the sense we might say, you go, girl. You can hear um, younger women use that term. And I used to have friends that talked about wearing the wearing tights. And uh, there's Wonder Woman up there. And um, they say it to one another when they're celebrating things like a promotion or an, a pregnancy or someone's left their violent husband or they've got a battle with cancer, they will say, Ashet Shayel, that is, you go. And according to this Jewish practice, being a woman of valour isn't about what you do, but how you do it. If you're a okay. stay-at-home mother, it says, be a stay-at-home mother of valour. If you are a nurse, be a nurse of valour. If you're a CEO, a teacher, a pastor, or a barista at Cafe Guru, be one of valour. And it doesn't matter whether you're poor or single or married or rich, you can do it all with the sort of qualities that she encapsulates. So that's what makes a Proverbs 31 woman. Now, I've got, I've got Wonder Woman up here for a reason. She's shown on Israeli television. And, of course, the Israelis speak modern Hebrew. What do you think Wonder Woman is translated as in Hebrew for the title of the show? Give us a Yes, correct. <laughs> she is indeed um, Ashet Shayil, and that is what Wonder Woman is known as in Israel on the television. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is just gorgeous. So we've come to the end of Proverbs 31 and we're ending on time. And um, I'll just take that slide down. 
Does anyone have any final questions they'd like to ask? I have a quick one. Yeah. Um, actually, it's probably not a quick one, but it's a quick question. So all these translations that are getting it wrong, even the ones that are supposedly the scholarly translations, yep. frustrate me to all heck. <laughs> do they, James? They do. <laughs> To the point that I even went to find a translation that I wouldn't usually go to because it probably goes too far in making everything fluffy and lovely, which is the inclusive Bible. But even that, that was the one of the ones I read out before, which was the strong yeah. and... Um, loving. Uh, strong and loving, yeah. Uh, woman, but still woman. But even then, it still kind of fails the mark. And I'm like, with the bloody inclusive Bible can't get it right. <laughs> Right. Um, you'd be surprised how many mistranslations there are in your Bibles. So is There's this heaps. a particularly Christian thing or are there even translations in the English of the Jewish, uh, the, of the Hebrew scriptures that are getting it wrong as well? Um, yeah, there's some things because uh, parts of the Hebrew tradition are quite patriarchal. So mm. they'll keep certain translations like they are. Um, and it is a Christian thing because it's in the New Testament as well. The one that drives me crazy is the stilling of the storm. There is a serious mistranslation of the Gospel of Matthew. If you read Matthew, Luke and Mark's story side by side, you will read a great windstorm comes up on the Lake of Galilee. You all know this story. Would you agree with that? Is this when he's asleep in the That's boat? That's when he's asleep in yeah. the boat. That is not what the Gospel of Matthew says. Now, in Luke and um, Mark, it's um, lilips, which is storm, and it's mega lilips in one of them, which is great storm. It's a windstorm. It yep. is not in the Gospel of Matthew. It's seismos. What does seismos mean, do you think? Earthquake. Earthquake. Right. Is it a windstorm? No. It's a bloody great earthquake. Is it the same as a windstorm? <clears throat> no. Does Matthew mean to say windstorm? No but you will not find that translated accurately in a single Bible that I know of. Wouldn't seismos be like a, um, a tsunami almost? Well, it's not a tsunami. Matthew uses it for a reason. He uses seismos only um, a few times in his Bible and it has a very significant meaning, but we won't go there because it'll take too long. So it's I'm calming, just pointing... it's calming the earthquake. It's No, it's not. It's oh, yes, sort of. Um, I'll discuss it with you at another time, James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> but my point is, it's a gross mistranslation of what Matthew says. Hmm. But they want to harmonise the three stories across the board, so they translate every single one as a windstorm. It is not a windstorm in Matthew. So anyway, um, that's just... But you will find all sorts of things like this, where translators make decisions all the time about how they will translate a word. It's not necessarily accurate. And that'll probably send you all into a mild panic, thinking, well, how do we ever trust this thing again? Um, if you get a good study Bible, it might point this stuff out to you. So I would suggest that's what you all do. Or you can learn the languages. That's a lot of work. I don't really recommend that. Um, I think a good study Bible would probably do the trick. But this is not a one-off, James. This happens all the time in the Hebrew and the New Testament. What's interesting, uh, Elizabeth, is uh, that in, in Israel, the military have both women and men, and they all yes. do the same jobs. That's right. And they're following on a fine tradition, obviously, from the Hebrew Bible, and they're not yes. letting it affect their judgment. Absolutely. Yes, correct. Um, Elizabeth, what uh, study Bible do you recommend? This one's pretty good. This is the Cambridge Annotated Bible. This is a study Bible. And John's got another one down there that's not bad too. I've got... Uh, Harper Collins one. Uh, this is the New Int Interpreter's Study Bible, which is uh, Abingdon. And, uh, yeah, the Harper Collins one's good too. Yeah, so, I mean, they, they the ones that we've got use the NRSV text, or they can get study Bibles also that use the NIV text. Um, I've, been, I've been reading the uh, HarperCollins Study Bible while we've been going on. Oh, right. <laughs> and it's interesting that they actually explain, you may not be convinced by it, but they explain why the word strength is used in 
31.3 and oh. valor, and uh, sorry, um, capable in 31.10 because after 31.3, they deprecate the idea of the woman being strong and they use the word which is used in many different contexts as capable or other things in other translations. Uh, now, I'm not, not saying that I'm convinced by it, but they do explain why it's used um, one way absolutely. in one verse and in a different yeah. way in seven verses later. Well, I think that the woman has this word shail um, mm. said about her at least seven times. That's right. And they translate at least four of them as strength. So that puts their argument in the bin as far as I'm concerned. Well, they're just doing it. They say in the context of these seven verses, that's why they're doing it. Now, oh, look. I'm not justifying it. I'm saying if you go to the footnote in yep. this interpreter's Bible, that's what they say. That's eating your, having your translator's cake and eating it too. Because they're well, saying, they're saying in this, in this line, really, we're going to really, say she's capable, but in the other lines, we'll say she's strong and say they're not part of the context. Get lost. That's all I've got to say to them. <laughs> well, I think also in some of these study Bibles, there are introductory chapters on the subtleties and difficulties of translation. Oh, we yeah. have a whole uh, spectrum of words in the Hebrew or the Greek and a whole spectrum of meanings in the English and it is an exceeding you, they, they're more or less saying you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't look it's that's true to a point <laughs> but it's not true in this case and I'm calling them out on it that's the <laughs> dodgy <laughs> stuff really it that's is translators butt covering isn't it? that's exactly right translators butt covering is a good way of describing it Gwyn, I like that <laughs> Because that's certainly what it is. Because you can't say that the first 10 verses are different to the context of the, to the last 10 verses, which is what they're trying to do. And you also can't say that Shail is commonly translated as good, virtuous, loving and capable everywhere else in the Hebrew Bible. It isn't, especially if it's talking about a male. It just isn't. So I say, down with your argument, in the bin. <laughs> All right, we better wrap up now and I'll let Maxine ask her question because it is a, a question that is um, the Tuggeron congregation have been worrying about. Um, for the rest of you, thank you for your attendance. I hope you enjoyed the rehabilitation of this woman in Proverbs and have realised she is not a domestic <laughs> goddess that you are meant to be living <laughs> up to and um, living your life around. But she, in fact, is probably an... Um, a mythological representation of Lady Wisdom who stands as the strong archetypal women that we all aspire to be.